Well, good morning, One Church family. How are we doing? You guys all right? Good, good, good. My name is Blake, and I'm the lead pastor here. I want to welcome every single person that's in the house today. It is wonderful to have you. If you're brand new and never come, I just want to tell you that I hope that you already feel right at home. We are so honored and humbled to have you a part of this place. And maybe you're joining us online somewhere out in the world. And I just want to tell you, thank you for being a part of what God's doing in this house Even through joining us online, I keep hearing over and over, like, man, I I was attending forever online, and I finally showed up, and I love it here. And so um, I'm just blown away by how this church continues to grow. We had, like, record attendance in the kids' ministry just recently. So will you guys give a hand to God for the way he's making this church just blow up? It's so cool. So um, I don't know if you noticed or not, but we built a brand new stage for me to stand on. So I had like 20 new people come and help us build this stage, and it took like a whole week to do it. I had like all these volunteers, and I want to honor them. Will you guys give them a hand for helping me out do that? It turned out great. I'm super pleased. And so I, all the custom work of building this in and putting the speakers back, and I just love it. It turned out really, really pretty. Most people will never notice, but I think it's really pretty myself. So anyways... Um, I'm excited about today, and that's because um, we actually, oh, the reason why I did it, by the way, in case you're wondering why, it's because I, I always felt so far back there, and now I feel like I can get right up in your business and grab hold of your heart, <laughs> right, and like you can spit on you, get sanctified by the pastor, right, so who doesn't want to be sanctified by the pastor's spit? <laughs> that's funny. Anyways, so today, we're starting a brand new series, and this series is, is our heart. Um, I I love to do this every single year, and it's very timely, I think, right now, uh, because there's so many new folks that have been a part of this church. It's important every year to go back over uh, what we're really all about. So I I call it a family talk. It's sort of like insider language, right? And uh, you're going to get to kind of come in and hear um, our heart, um, our vision, our our values, our strategy, uh, the purpose of why we exist And why we do what we do. And so I love talks like this because I love casting vision uh, of what we can become. And I love to talk about um, where God's brought us and where we're headed, right? And here's what I say a lot is that vision leaks. If you don't continually bring it up, talk about uh, what our heart is, then and we don't continue to talk about why we do what we do, it'll go away. And so it's important to always talk about our, our heart and our, our family. So this is kind of a family talk. And so my prayer is that as you hear our family, you're like, man, this is my hope, is that you're like, yeah, okay, so that's what they're about. And maybe in hearing what we're about, you go, you know what, I want to be about that. And not just that, I want to be on mission with them. And so um, I would like to say that the series title is called We Are One, okay? So We Are One. And uh, when you say we are one, you have to do it by actually making our logo with your hands. You have to go, we are one. Okay, so this is our logo if you didn't know that. And so everybody do what you say, we are one. That was good. Okay, good. So um, I, I think talking about being one right now is right on time. And I think it's providential uh, because I love to talk about being united in Christ and the importance of of becoming one, so much so that, you know what, we bought the website, and we also made a logo, and we renamed our church. Uh, so I really believe in being one. And so if you didn't know that, our website is b1church.com. And so um, not, not only that, <laughs> this is funny to me anyways, I painted the entire church a paint color, and the paint color is called agreeable gray, right? <laughs> so I'm like, it has to work. Like Nobody's ever going to come here and disagree. Because our paint is agreeable gray. Thank you very much. So actually, actually, the truth is we named this church One Church because of a prayer that we found in John 17. Um, I actually call it the Lord's Prayer um, because the actual Lord's Prayer that we say, our Father which art in heaven, it's actually a disciple's prayer. Uh, it's the, the, they were saying, hey, will you teach us how to pray, right? So the Lord's Prayer is what you find in John 17 right before he's arrested. And you find this dialogue, this beautiful picture of the father and the son talking and and, and saying, why did I come here, God? Why why did you send me to this place? And and then he's making a request. And you know what his request was? Six different times, may they be one. May they be one. May they be one. 
may they be one. Like over and over and over, we see the heart of our Savior Yeshua speak that. that. That is the heart of God. And you know what? I can give the rest of my life to making that come to fruition. Are you with me? Okay, so everybody say, we are one. Okay. Um, I actually, while I was thinking about this uh, the whole, all week long, <laughs> I kept singing this song while, while I was writing my sermon. And you, if you guys have been around the church at all, you're like, oh, I know this song. I, I know that. I used to sing it as well. And so it's actually the very first <laughs> song that I ever learned on the guitar. And I'm really proud of this. There's two chords, right? And so I'm going to teach you those two chords. It was E minor, okay, and A minor. Thank you very much. And so, and so this song is an old song that goes like this. And it, I would play it because it's all that I knew how to do. I didn't know how to strum yet. And I'd just go like this. We are one in spirit. We are one in one in the, well, I'll start over. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And so so I, I said, hey, Ali, you know, I, I know how to play the guitar. You want me to teach you? And so I did exactly that. Like, I, all I was doing is like this one strum. She's like, wow, honey, that's really good. And so I was like, hey, I, I had just started dating her. I'm like, hey, I want you to come meet my, my parents. And so she came to my parents' house, and when she came over to my parents' house, like, she sat down, and um, she was meeting all of them, and I was like, hey, I've got to go, and I left, right? And I left them for hours, and she, she, my wife, my mom, and all of them, like, she was left alone with my family, right? And she was like, hey, you remember when I taught you how to play that song, and you learned how to play that song? She's like, oh, yeah, I remember. You had left me, <laughs> and I picked up this, the guitar because nobody was there, and I started playing that song. I was like, hold on a second. You were singing that song? Like, they'll know we're Christians by our love? You were singing that and you were mad at me? Like, <laughs> that's, that's messed up. So anyways, if you know it, sing it with me. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. Are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, we are Christians by our love. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, it's really kind of a lame song, uh, musically, but theologically, man, it's just packed with, I really do want that to be like my prayer, like, God, would, would all unity one day be restored? Is that possible? Could all unity one day be, like that's my prayer, right? And will they know that we really are Christians by our love? Can that, can that be real? And so I, I've been thinking about that very much because I, I want it. I long for it, especially right now. And that's really why I wanted to go back to being a church leader. Because I, I haven't seen that in the world. And I, I, I don't want like, you know, slick, polished, perfect I want a church that actually does that. And so I, I just felt God calling me like, can you make a, a, a church family like your living room that feels like that? Because when you've been a part of a bunch of believers that are actually like connected together by the power of the Spirit, and there's like this camaraderie, it's called koinonia, this, this like oneness that happens. There's something that's so beautiful to that. And there's something that's like they've come together to bond it in love. And there's nothing like that on earth when you've experienced it. And so that's where you find all comfort. It's where you find compassion. It's where you find gentleness. All the fruits of the Spirit are lived out inside of a biblical community. And I love the way that Paul describes that when he's describing the humility of Jesus in, in Philippians chapter 2. But it's actually not just talking about becoming imitators of Jesus. It's actually saying this is what the church should look like. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. Everybody say united. If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. How? How do we make your joy complete? By being like-minded. Having, having the same what? The same love. Being one in spirit and of one mind. The NIV says one in spirit 
and purpose. Having one mind. That, that's what I want to be about. That, that's what I want the heart of this place to be about. To be like-minded with the same love, one in spirit and purpose. Psalms 133 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. I know that that's the heart of the Father. If you want to know the heart of our Father God, what, what he wants for his children, his creation, it's that we would be living together in unity. And uh, I know that in my house anyway, as a dad, the very uh, limited experience that I have in raising four daughters, I love it when my daughters are like, you know, living in harmony. And there's like singing and laughter and they're like getting along, you know, like, or your grandkids, if you can relate. So I, I love how good and pleasant that is. And so I need two volunteers. You know what? I picked the two of you, two big, gigantic men. Come on, come on, Chad. Come on, you're up. Chad, come on, come on. He's like, he's on his phone. I busted the elder. It's awesome. So, so I want you guys to come up here, and you're going to actually uh, help me preach today, okay? So in the Bible, there's a word in Hebrew. Stand right beside me. Get up here. These guys are big. <laughs> okay, this is perfect, right? So, yeah, no, I like that. Keep your arms around me. I like that, yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. We're talking about unity, yeah. Closer, that's good. Okay, so there's a Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word uh, for unity is actually yachat. And so you have to hack loogie when you say it. Yach, yachat. So I want to see you tr try that for me. Yach. No, 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 no. Say it. Yachat. Yach. Say the D. What are you doing? I think he's better than that. Say yachat. I got to say it like a redneck. <laughs> okay. Yachat. Was that better? Duh. Duh. <laughs> yachat. Yachat. Okay, that's pretty good. That's right. Yachat. That's pretty good, yeah. Everybody say yachat. Yachat. That was good, okay. So I want you guys to actually teach this. It, it, it means these different words. So I want you to say this one, right? Alike. And then you'll say the next one. You ready? Say the first one. Alike. United. Unitedness. Yeah. I have my glasses. That's okay. Union. <laughs> Community, all together. That's good. One accord. Be united. Be joined. Oh, that's good. You guys crushed that. So keep your arms around me. I like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you know when you've been around like that kind of yachad. When you've had this like, it's, have you ever been on a missions trip where you like all of a sudden there's one mind? Like there's one, there's the same love. And you've done something together. You've accomplished something that's beautiful for the kingdom of God. And you feel the delight of the Father. And all of a sudden, you're like, man, this was, this was amazing to be a part of this thing that we did on planet Earth as, as humans. I feel like I was a part of what God was asking. I united with heaven, right? And so my sermon today is called Love Works. Say Love Works. Love Works. Love Works. Love Works. So here's, here's the thing. It's a, it's a play on words. I don't know if you caught it. It's brilliant. Love works, but it actually, like, works, right? And so I have a demonstration of that, and that's this. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's railroad spikes, railroad spikes, right? And it's really heavy. I want you to feel how both of you grab, grab a hold of that, right? Rail, railroad spikes. And so it's, like, you know, all welded together, and this is the O, right? Do you guys see it, love? Okay, you guys understand? And so this is bound together by something. It's bound together by a weld. And it's really strong. And you guys are really big dudes. And what I'd love to see is could the two of you try to take it apart? Really, I want you to rip it apart. Like, come on, just, just rip it. Come on. Come on, boys. What you got? Just go ahead and rip, rip that apart. Okay, you guys can sit down. Give them a hand, everybody. You guys did great. did great. Hey, Chad, stay off your phone. I'm preaching. <laughs> what the heck? What is that? <laughs> so um, you, you know when you've been around... Uh, seeing love work. You, you've felt it. You've been around people where they're like, man, they, they're like putting in the work. They see, they see the love of God. I see this beautiful picture of when this happened on planet earth. It was, it was right um, after Jesus had rose from the dead and the church was being established. It was like a birth of a brand new baby church. And you know how they described it? In, in Acts chapter two, they actually said they devoted themselves. It started with devotion. They devoted themselves to what? the apostles' teaching, right? There was a proclamation of the word, to fellowship, right, to one another, and to breaking of bread and to what? Prayer. That's what they did. So we should do that because that's what the early church did. And that's what I love about the Christian church, this, the rest restoration movement, is we want to devote ourselves 
to being as close to the New Testament church as possible. And so that's, that's what they did, so that's what we do. And so it says, everyone was filled with awe, say awe, awe and wonders, many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. So we're like, you're Pastor Blake, you're in awe of the amazing stage that I built, right? All this is signs and wonders. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyways, all the believers were together, and they had three words. Everybody say with me, everything in common. So they were all together, and they had everything in common. How in the world did they have everything in common? I, I don't even get that at all. Because you have to understand the context. These people had come from all the surrounding nations. There were thousands of people there, thousands and they were from different cultures, like different tribes and nations, completely different backgrounds. They had different ethnicity. They didn't even speak the same language. They couldn't talk. How in the world could they have everything in common? From the outside looking in, to me, they had nothing in common. Nothing. But, but there's something that happened. When the power of the Holy Spirit gets up in there and he does this glue thing where all of a sudden you're like joined together. You're like, I'm around people. I have no idea who they are or how to talk to them. And yet, and yet man, I love them. I, I've experienced this in cultures where I can't speak the language and yet we just hug and it's like, there's this like brother, man, my sister, right? You, you become a family inside of the house of God. And that's that's what's beautiful. Now, if 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 anyone should demonstrate that in our world today, if there is any hope or any chance of a group of people that could actually live that out, it should be the church of the living God, bound together by the love of God. Amen. So, we just talked about Colossians the last few weeks and Colossians 3.14 talks about this. It says, over all the virtues, put on love, which what? Binds them. It binds them together. Love is bound together in perfect unity. So, so why can't we try that? Why can't we as the church li live that out and be that? I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just making a big old mess. So I want us to like be the kind of people that go, man, we're bound together. I'm welded to, to these people. And I, I can't be ripped apart from them because that's, that's who my family is. And so when, when it says to put on love and it's bound together by, by, by perfect unity, perfect, really? Like that sounds really ambitious to have perfect unity. It sounds impossible, honestly, especially today. But why not? Why not us? Why not in 2021, why can't we be the people that show the world what that looks like? But why can't we be the ones that say, hey, hey, we figured it out, what perfect unity is. On Friday, my wife sent me to the grocery store. She's really weird and rare. I don't do that a whole lot. And when I, when I went, she was like, I need you to get three things. We have people coming over, three things. I need cilantro, I need tomatoes, I need tortilla chips. She was going to make some of her famous salsa. If you've had her salsa, it's the glory of God. And so she's like, those three things, you need it? And I think she said those three things to me six times, right? Like, dude, this is what, hey, Blake. And after she said it six times, she's like, do you need me to send that to you in a text? <laughs> and I was like, I've got it. cilantro, uh, I, what, what, tomatoes? And, and so I, even, anyways, so I, I go to the store. And while I'm walking around, I've been studying about the love of God all week long. And I walk into the store, and I'm looking around, and I'm realizing it is so quiet. Everybody's head is down, and they all are wearing masks, and it's so quiet. Nobody is talking. And so I'm like, man, this is sad. And so I decided, I'm going to change it. And I just got real chirpy, like annoyingly happy, you know? And I was like, hi. I'm smiling real big and cheesing. Ha! Ah, ah. Ha! And people were freaked out. They didn't know what to do. They're like walking around like with their push cart, you know, and they have their head down there. They do this thing and another thing, and they look at me, and they're like, 
hi. Like, oh, we said something. That's amazing. And say hi. And they actually genuinely, you could, tell, you could feel this like, oh, yeah, we talk to each other. We're, we communicate with other people. And it was this weird, like, we, we, we have to step into the silence right now. We have to, like, stop allowing this. And can I be really candid with you? As your pastor, I just need you to know that I've been waking up in the mornings and I'm overwhelmed with dread. And I feel this despair. And I feel alone. And it's all because of what I feel like a lot of the world and humanity feels. Like this groaning deep within our spirit and our gut. And I've been waking up with it. And I just got to tell you something. I'm so sick of all the division. And I'm mad about it. And I need to say, I want my life back. I want what we had. I want the beautiful joy that was so a part of what. And it seems like it's not coming back. And it's, this has gone on so long. I just feel like, can we have that all behind us? Because I'm so tired of the fear. I, I'm fed up with the fear. And I'm so sick of all of the sickness. We're, we're worn down. And I feel like humanity is really, really heavy. And I think it's imperative, if ever before, that we as the body of Christ demonstrate like never before the love of Christ. So, so we have to kind of go, well, okay, Lord, what is it? Like, I want to have an urgency. I want to have this. I want to lean into this thing. And here's what I feel like the Lord keeps saying to me. He's saying, Blake, push back the dread and walk in my delight. Push back the dread and walk in my delight and help the world to experience my love through your delight in me. And so it made me go, you know what? That's right. And it made me all the more passionate about our mission here. Because what we do here is we passionately love God and we intentionally love people. That, that's what we do. Will you guys say that with me? We passionately love God and we intentionally love I don't know if you caught the key to that. But the key is one word, and the word is love. love. Love is the finest commodity that we exchange in the world. There is nothing more valuable than to become the love of God. As believers, love, love is our foundation. It's, it's what we build our very life on. To, to understand the movement of Christ is to get your head and your heart around the biblical understanding of what love really is and what it looks like. It's the beginning and the end of all Christian theology. And to be very clear here at One Church, our goal is to love. That's our goal. It's everything. And we're passionate about it around here. So if you come up to me and say, hey, Pastor Blake, I want to know. Tell me about that. What's, what, what's your five-year plan? What's your strategy, mission, and values? What are you going to do? What are you gonna... Well, I, if you ask me that, apparently that was Chad asking me. <laughs> If you ask me that, I'm going to say, well, I'm glad you asked. I have an answer. I think it's just to love God and love people. Or to, to know God and to make him known. That, that's, that's my plan. So if you think that's a dumb plan, that's about all I've got. So I, I just need you to, to hear that that's, that's the heart of this church. There is this brilliant Swiss theologian who wrote a lot of books. He was a Reformed uh, theologian. And he was at a, a conference or a you know, whatever, like he was giving a talk. And as he was done, this young whippersnapper a student came up to him and said, uh, Mr. Barth, w would you condense your life's work, your whole life's work in theology into one sentence? And he said, well, actually, I can't. My, my mom used to sing to me. So at my mother's knee, she, she taught me this. You know what she'd sing? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Hmm. It's pretty good. Love is everything. In fact, the reason why I know that love is everything is because God is everything, and God is love. It's not just an attribute, right? It's not something that God does in spite of the book Love Does. It's not a side effect. It's not an offshoot. It's the very character and nature 
of our God. In fact, it says in 1 John 4, 8, if anyone who does not love, if you don't love, you don't know God. Wow. Have you ever met a, a Christian that doesn't know how to love? They, it's because they don't know God. And the Bible calls them a resounding gong or a clinging symbol in 1 Corinthians. If you don't know love, you don't understand God. And in fact, it goes on to say, because God is love. Many people have a really small understanding of love because they, they have been fed a lie from uh, pop Christianity through, through books and songs. One song is love is a verb. And we try to describe it and, and we try to say what it is. And, and by saying it's a verb, it's so much more than that. Love, love is not a what. Love is not a how. Love is a it's the essence of who Yahweh actually is. And if you are his child, then love becomes the essence of who you are. It should be anyways, because we're imitators of God and we become like our, our Abba Father or like our, his son, Yeshua. Love is actually who we are. And historically, the church has been really bad at that. We, we, we like to, to beat people up with the truth of God. And we like with the Bible, we Bible thump in like hard, like we love our bullhorns. And we make people uh, feel like we're whistleblowers and telling them who they're, who they're not always instead of telling them who they are. And so historically, the church is not great at love. The church is made of people and people live from a place of brokenness. And we try our very best at our version of love, but our understanding of love comes with conditions. And that's because we've been through lots of pain. We've experienced an enormous amount of hurt. And so hurt people, they hurt people, right? And so guess what? The church, I just need you to know, even though we're named one church and we have agreeable gray, the, the church will hurt you. This church will hurt you because it's made up of people. And so I, I'm going to be really upfront about that. Um, it's not an if, but it's a win. Church people hurt people because we're, we're people. We're, we're great at, at that. We're, we're a hot mess. And so that's why it, it hurts so bad when we have church hurt because we feel like it should be a safe place. We're like this is, everyone should be exactly like Jesus, right? But that's impossible. So that's why we say nobody's perfect here because messy people are welcome in this church. And if you're perfect, maybe you should consider another church because you'll mess up what we have going. <laughs> and so um, God actually allows her. And usually it's for our own growth. It's for our own discipline. And it's birthed from love. Every good parent knows that sometimes I have to discipline. And love without discipline, it's hypocrisy. But discipline without love is brutality. See, God's love is, is it's balanced in both. There's, there's truth, but there's also grace. There's, there's discipline, but there's also love. And I'd like to teach you something that, that's been very meaningful to me this week in studying uh, what it means to be one. Have you ever heard of the Jewish prayer? It's called the Shema. Um, it's called Shema because that's one word in Hebrew that means listen. It means hear. It's like saying... Come on, are you listening? It's what the Shema actually means. And it's God trying to show us, his chosen people, uh, his very heart. He's like, hey, hey, listen, I need you to get this. It's the most fundamental expression of the Jewish faith. And so it's common practice for every devout Jew to do this every morning. They'll wake up and do this sweet prayer and every single night. And so it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? One. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, many theologians get this messed up, and they start talking about the Trinity. And they talk about, this is talking about the Lord is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But that's out of context for when God gave this to them. Understand, the people of Israel had just escaped tyrannical slavery in Egypt. And now they're out in the desert 
And what, what is God wanting to do? He's wanting to say, hey, can, can I tell you my heart? And, and, and you have to understand where they were. They had all of these surrounding nations. And all of the surrounding nations, they were what's called polytheist. So they worshipped many gods. But the Jews were monotheists. And that's what they're teaching right here. They're saying, the Lord's your God. The Lord is one. And so all the, of the other nations, they had the God of rain and the God of fertility and the God of agriculture and the sun God, and they worshiped all of these. And so God's saying, stop that nonsense. You, you will worship the one true God. I, the Lord, am the one God. And what he said after that is, and when you worship me, I need you to not hold back anything. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your strength. And so this is about allegiance. This is about devotion. And so he actually goes into that. Our, our creator, God Elohim, is serious about delighting in him. That's what he wants. He wants our delight with all that we say, with all that we have, with all that we do. He wants our hearts completely, fully devoted, worshiping him. And, and he wants us to not only do that uh, when, when we wake up in the morning, but when we go to bed at night. And he wants us to raise our children to be fully devoted and love him, right? He wants us to be singing and worshiping along the way as we're walking or driving our cars. And he wants our homes and our cities to be all in, completely sold out and committed to Yahweh. He doesn't, he doesn't want some of our love. It turns out he's actually really a jealous God. He doesn't like to share us with other gods. He, he wants us to be all in and to depend on him, to have our complete allegiance in him for our strength, for our health, for our sustenance, right? For all of our agriculture, for our food. He's like, I've got you. And if we don't do that and we turn to these other gods and worship these other um, small G gods, then, then it says that his anger will burn against us. And not only that, he says he'll destroy us and wipe us from the land. And you're like, Blake, that's the Old Testament. Understand, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And so the truth found in the Old Testament, and, and especially right here where he's shaping the Israelites to understand his Shema, he's saying, listen, this is what I need you to be about. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when Jesus came here, what did he do? He didn't take away from that. He added to that. He said, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And so here's the part where I kind of geeked out this week. As I was thinking about the Shema, it brought me to where we're at in the world today. And like, God, why are so many bad things happening? And what are we supposed to learn from this? And so I've had this strange obsession with understanding and studying Revelation right now. And in Revelation, there's an understanding of a beast system. And I've been thinking about, well, what is the beast? And there's a lot of people, theologians, talking about this right now. And so I, it hit me really hard that when John the Revelator actually brought up this idea of, of binding something to your wrists and to your forehead, it comes exactly from right here. Did, did you catch in Deuteronomy 6? It says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. It says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. So that's why he's, he's saying all day, every day, I want you to have the devotion and delight of the Father on your heart. So that is about allegiance. And so when John brings up in verses 13, chapter 13, 16, 17, he says, and also it causes, he's talking about the, the beast system. It causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on their, where? Right hand or their forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. When John brought that up, th there was no doubt 
that people understood what this was about. Every listener would have known this is about all of our allegiance. It's about our devotion. It's about our heart. And as your pastor, I need you to hear me, One Church, that it's not a far stretch at all to warn you as a church that the mark is coming. I mean, it's, I'm just reading the Bible. The mark is coming, and it'll be placed in your skin, and it, you won't be able to buy or sell without it. And I, I don't think that's a stretch. Like, I buy everything with my phone, right? I just walk up and pay for it. And, and so every card that I have has a chip on it. And the technology is already there, and it's happening in the world where there is a, a chip system inside of people somehow where they buy and sell. And I just need you to hear that God is serious about your devotion. You will either choose him or you will choose the world. Will you depend on him for your sustenance or will you choose the world? And God, God is saying that if you choose the world, he, he will do exactly like he said he would do to the Israelites. You, you will be wiped from the earth and you'll have no place with him in heaven. Now, I, I need you to hear, I, I don't love preaching that. God's gonna discipline his church though. He is right now. And he's calling his children to himself. And so when Jesus came here and he was teaching the Shema, he was explaining that this is about devotion, guys. And then he added to it, and, and he says in John 13, so now I am giving you a new commandment. And these three words, by the way, love each other, love each other, I think I could say that every single week for the, like, for the rest of my time as a pastor. Hey, I'm glad you came back this week. Here's my sermon, love each other. Now go do that, have a nice week, right? And put money in the basket. <laughs> Because love each other is really all we're supposed to do. If you get that right, then that's all, all that we have. Love each other. Just as I have loved you and you love each other, your love for one another will what? Prove to the world that you're my disciples. So here at One Church, I want us to be really intentional about our love for people so we can prove to the world, hey, I'm a disciple of the living God. And we can create a place where we really mean, hey, everybody's welcome here. Nobody's perfect, and with Jesus, anything is possible. When, when we come to this house, we lay aside our preferences and we brace our differences. And some, something we say all the time that I think is really good is that in essentials, in the things that are the most important essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, there's liberty. But in all things, we, we have love. And I like to make a pastor joke that that actually was... St. Augustine that said it. Some people say that. Other people say John Wesley. We don't know for sure, but so let's just say St. Bergstrom said it. I, I like that. So what, is, what does that mean, Blake, to, to essentials, non-essentials, unity, liberty? Um, well, I, I think it's really simple. We keep the main thing the main thing. They're, they're, in a world so divided, can we be united? In a world where everybody is charged, whether whatever political affiliation you are, right? Whether, whether you've been vaccinated or unvaccinated, whether or not you believe this certain thing or that certain thing. In essentials, which are like resurrection, was Jesus really the Messiah? You know, in the essentials of whether he was a virgin birth, those things we stand on together. We're unified. In non-essentials, there are things like, you know, whether or not you believe people have to speak in tongues, whether or not you believe in the supernatural gifts of, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, or, or maybe it's a sin. Maybe you want to talk about uh, whether or not drinking should be done or not by believers or, or sexual sins, right? Those, those things, vaccines, political affiliation, those things, those things, temporary, they're, they're, they're things that you can have opinion on. They're things that, they're non-essentials and there's liberty. There's liberty to talk about those things. There's freedom in the house of God to talk about those things. And so I, I just want to say that here, at, at this church, we, we will not allow the enemy of darkness to divide the church and cause dissension. Instead, in all things, what we're going to do here is demonstrate the love of Christ because everybody's welcome in this house. And since, since we're talking about it, when, when did this happen? When, when do we no longer allow to have open and honest dialogue? Like, where did that go? Why can't we talk? When, when, when people are silenced 
and they're made to feel that they can no longer speak and they don't have a voice. That is called abuse. And I, I won't allow that in this church. People can talk here. It, it's actually hatred when you, when you silence people. And it's the work of the enemy of darkness. He hates reason. He hates truth. And he wants to silence anybody that's speaking truth with boldness. He, he likes to, things to stay in the dark and hidden. He doesn't like the light. And so here at this church, we step out in the light with all the things that we're walking through right now. Because it's heavy, and I want you to know you're not alone, and you don't have to carry it alone. We bear one another's burdens together, so you have a voice here, and we can actually have reason, and we can have dialogue. So for the record, in this house, we aren't afraid of healthy and honest questions, and I'm believing that if you do have a question, you will be met with gentleness and kindness, because it's kindness that leads to repentance. It's not hatred. When you come with hatred and you Bible thump and beat people up with the Bible, I've never heard somebody go, man, that's so good, thank you, I repent, right? It's kindness that leads us. It softens the heart so people can hear the voice of the Spirit and then the love of God will enter in. So that's why it matters what church you go to. That's why it matters that we talk about this, the vision and mission of, of a church because if you're going to a church that's not talking about the truth, Man, there's too much at stake right now. And people are, are lost. And there's so much darkness. And if we, you come to a church where we just speak with hollow and empty words and there's no like, you know, talking about the truth. There's, there's a lot of pastors that aren't teaching the word of God. There's a lot of churches that don't speak to the matters of the heart. So people walk away and they don't feel conviction of the Holy Spirit and there's not life change. And there's way too many churches that are filled with pride and they're just trying to be cool and trendy and slick. And I, I gotta tell you, I don't have time for that. The, the days are drawing near where our Savior is gonna come back. So I have this like urgency to my words right now. I don't want a cheap imitation of the power and presence of God. I want the real thing. I want the roof to be blown off, the walls to fall down, and people to come to the Father broken and weary and ready to actually experience the love of God. That's what I want, don't you? So if a church is healthy and it's on mission, there's going to be three things about that church that's never going to change. Those things are evangelism, discipleship, and mission. Every church that's worth their weight in gold are doing that. And so those three things, we have a way to say that that I think is easy to remember so you can say it out loud. And I, I wanna say it. We, we continually strive to know God, grow deep, and go love. Will you guys say that with me? We continue to strive, to whatever, to know God, grow deep, and go love. A lot of churches have one or two of those, right? Right? They're really good at evangelism, but they're horrible at discipleship. That church is a mile wide and an inch deep. Right? Have you heard of that? Or maybe really great at discipleship, but nobody gets baptized unless they're eight. Right, <laughs> And so I, I, I want to be focused on all three and healthy in all three. People who are passionate about knowing the living God that are devoted to growing deep in their faith and their big old bundle of love to go out and love the world. So, so no, grow, go, yippee, I-O. Like that's our heart, right? <laughs> this Friday, I, I went out with a friend of mine that's brand new. He's right here. Tom, say hi. Just wave to everybody. This is Tom. I, I hate that I'm picking on him. Tom's a gorgeous man. And we, we went and started to play, play Frisbee golf. And um, we played nine holes out here. It's just installed, new tee boxes. It's a blast. You got to go play it. And so while I was playing with him, uh, uh, well, first I needed to do this. Like the first round, he beat me really bad. But the second round, we were tied at the end. We had to play a hole, the last hole, right? To, and, and who won? Blake did. Thank you very much. <laughs> How old are you, 65, 70, something like that? I, I beat 70-year-olds and go oh, up higher. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I can whip 70-year-old. Thank you. So I anyways, we were playing we were playing Frisbee golf, having a great time and talking. And I was like, so you're new around here. And you know what he does? This guy, he's an apologist. He loves to talk theology. And he's given his life to that, 20 years. To teach in fifth graders. What? That's weird. So he has this book on apologetics to, to teach tweens. That's so cool. Like, get out of here. So tell me about yourself. So we're playing golf. I'm like, well, what have you experienced? You just started coming here. Tell me what you feel about this church. Tell me what you think. And you know what that guy said? I'm like, what? This is what he said. He said, 
there's an undeniable feeling of energy and passion. And people are on fire for Christ. You could see it in their faces, hear it in their words, and see it in their step. That's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> and so I said, well, you don't know him like I do. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I, I actually said, that's true. That, that's true. That's who they are. They're so kind. Incredibly kind people. And you can feel it when you walk in. Like, There's something. This is just palpable. Like in the air. Sincere. Something beautiful is happening in this house. And that's what the world needs right now. It's desperate for that. That kind of connection. Real and vibrant intimacy. I, I experienced this last Saturday night. It wasn't at a church. I went to a, one of my favorite concerts I've ever been to. It was a band called Lone Bellow, and they, they, uh, we were at a place called the Variety Playhouse, and so I, I'd never been there, never experienced this place, a little small uh, venue, and everybody's like standing, standing room only, like we're all up front, and he ends with this song that's called May You Be Well, and it's like this blessing that he sang over us, and I'm telling you, man, everybody's like singing it as loud as they could. And you were just like, you, everybody's like crying. It's so emotional. The spirit in that place was like, yes. It's like so good to be with people again and singing and smiling and happy. And, and I, I'm telling you, it was good, but it's not like what we feel in the church. Like what we feel here during worship, the, the way people lean in and sing from their heart to the living God and the presence of God drops on the house. Like there's nothing, nothing in the world like that. And I just have to ask you a question. So when you're doing worshiping God like that, you know what happens? We aren't focused, we aren't focused on the stuff of this world. We aren't focused on dread, are we? When we're worshiping God, we're focused on delight. And when we're delighting in God, and our focus is like singular to the one true God, something happens, like all the stuff of the world, it melts away. The things of earth grow strangely dim, right? It's like funny how what, what, we, what divides us and what separates us, we're not focused on that. We're just present in the moment, filled with delight, not dread. And I, I, I hope you know that that's what your father wants. That's the very heart of God is, is for kids to come in here and experience the love of God and the kids ministry, students to be caught on fire by, by the love of God. And the, the delight in the father is what it's all about. So when people come here and they're heavy, 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 and they're having a hard time, it's really difficult sometimes to break through your heavy so you can actually believe and receive the ruthless love of God. But when it happens, it's so beautiful. I have a question for you. Do you know that the Father is really fond of you? Ah, he's so into you. He's fond of you. Will you say that to the person beside you? Say, the Father is fond of you. Now, now, I want you to say this to yourself. Say, the Father is fond of me. Will you say it? The Father is fond of me. Most people want to believe that, but they don't. Most people really don't believe that, and they don't, don't really receive the, the Father's delight. Because they've never seen it in person. Because they've never seen that lived out from the people around you. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good at love. My, my family, my house feels like love. My daughters, they would say, my dad loves everybody. And that's a beautiful thing that they would say that about me. But I'll tell you, man, I, even I like, feel often like, I don't know that I receive your love. I don't know that I believe your love. And I think I'm kind of the same way with God. Because my understanding of, of God's love is, is by the love I've seen and felt and experienced. I mean, my wife and I, like, we're, we're crazy in love with each other. Like, scale of one to ten. I mean, it's like, you know, eight, maybe nine. Some days nine. We're pretty good. I date her. You know, we, we pursue each other. We're going on a trip this week. I mean, we, like, we, we try to pursue each other. We date. Like, we're into each other. She's, and she's really jealous for my love. She doesn't want to share me at all. Like she doesn't, if I walked around this church holding somebody else woman's hand, like she's going to beat them up. It's dangerous. She, she's all about me. 
And I have to tell you something, though. Like, we are crazy about each other. And I'll walk in the house and I'll see her for the first time after a long day. And I will immediately think, she, uh, she's probably upset with me. Yeah. Like, are you okay? And like, sometimes we wake up in the morning and we're mad at each other. It's like, what's your problem? I don't know. What's your problem? And it's like, Bleh. right? We just do that. <laughs> like this. <laughs> Come on. Am I alone? Like, that's what marriage is. Like, sometimes she's like, I don't understand it. I love you more than anyone else in the world, and I don't, I'm, you're my enemy. You're Al-Qaeda, right? In my house. And so, sometimes it feels like that, like the, the, we are so bad at love. Like, we're so bad at, at this. When I'm trying to, even this week, I was like saying, honey, I'm for you. And I, can we come to a place where we come to each other and we actually delight in each other? You think to yourself always, my husband wants to be with me because he delights in me. And it's not just like, are you mad? Are you upset? Or, no, I'm not upset. Are you upset? We don't do those games. Instead, it's like, I know you're delighting in me right now. <laughs> Hi, baby, I'm home. Delighting, aren't you? Right? Let's do that. Like, why can't we delight in one another? Stop with the games. Listen, listen. Can we do this with God? Would you be willing to try to believe and receive the ruthless love of God? Because his, his love, it's different. It's different than any kind of man, woman, or child. Humans don't love like God. The, the love of God is, it's always and only unifying. It's always delighting. It's indivisible. It's unoffendable. Love actually works. His love. His agape, unconditional love. It's different than anything you've ever experienced. It changed my life. And I've given my life to help people understand the love of God. We have to understand something that's very key to this. We, we have to stop comparing the love of God to the love of man. Your earthly father, your dad, like he, he might have been awful to you. And I need to say to you that that's not the fatherly love. Our Abba Father that's unconditional in his love, he's different than that. So stop putting that on God. His love comes with no conditions. The love that people have for people is so fickle and it's unpredictable and it's conditional. But God's real love, the kind that only God can give, it destroys the word separation. God's love tears down every stronghold of division. God's love eradicates anything that keeps us from loving one another. God's love always and only unifies. The way Paul said that is, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. Did you catch that? God can't break up with you. It's not in his wheelhouse. He will never leave. He will never play games with his love. He, he doesn't take away his love. He doesn't ever withhold his love from you. He will never abandon you because he can't. It's not in his nature because he is love. He, he doesn't just have love. He doesn't just use love. He doesn't pretend to love. He is love. And his love left heaven where he was being worshipped by the angels to come down here and say, I love you. And he gave us a love letter that we can read every day to say one thing to you, the people of God and those that are far from God. I love you. I love you. Would you receive it? Would you believe it? Would you delight in my love? Will you guys bow your heads and pray with me? Is there anybody here that is not good at believing and receiving the love of God. If you are there, would you just raise your hand? And I want to say a prayer for you. There's hands all over the house. If you can't believe and receive the love of God, I see you. I feel you. And maybe today you're also at a place where you're like, I've never 
ask God into my heart. And maybe you've, you've never said, I, I didn't understand that God left heaven to love me and that he died on the cross so he could love me. And maybe for the first time, you're like, I, I want that, Blake. If that's you and you want to choose to follow after God and you want to love him and allow him to wash your sins away and forgive you so you can understand his word and become a fully devoted disciple and understand what it means to walk in the power of the spirit and to feel that and to actually learn to love people because you understand the love of God. If that's you and you're ready to receive the love of Christ, maybe for the first time, would you raise your hand? We want you to know something. Today, you made the biggest decision of your life. And that's to be fully devoted, to give your allegiance and surrender to God. Will you guys all um, pray with me? Just say, say this out loud. Father God, I repent. I surrender my life to you. I give you all that I am. I give you all my strength give you all my heart and all my soul. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Purify me. God, would you fill me with the power of your spirit? Would you allow me to walk on earth for your glory? I want to delight in you, God. Would you delight in me? Jesus, I praise you. And I give you my life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said, Amen.